located at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin on Lake Michigan. It's a difficult place to get to. To get to the island you have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across Washington Island to Jerry and only ferry to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed on Rock Island. Even though the island is relatively small at about 975 acres, it has had an interesting history. In the early 1600s it was inhabited by a tribe of Potawatomi Native Americans as well as a small fishing village of Europe. The two groups did not trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that almost led to violence, but for the most part they lived peacefully together on the island. By the 1640s the Potawatomi had migrated to other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after the Potawatomi had left the island, some settlers from the fishing village reported seeing a new group of people on the island. More white settlers, but they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to talk to one of these new settlers, or even find where they were living. It was around this time that strange things started to happen in the village. Several animals, it's not mentioned what they were. Maybe it was pigs or chickens and seemed to have been used to make markings in blood on some of the buildings in the village. On a different night a building used for preserving meat burned down. The villagers felt that these things must have been done by these new people on the island, and they intended to find them. But after a thorough search of the island, including the wooded inland area, they never found to stop soon after the search and none of the other settlers were ever seen again. In 1836 the Potawatomi Lighthouse was built on the northern part of the island. After construction was finished, the lighthouse was inspected, and it was reported back that the material of which the lighthouse and dwelling are made are of the best workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the light on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of construction of the lighthouse, David Corbin started to complain that plaster started to fall off the building and some sort of liquid would ooze through cracks. Corbin was completely alone most of the time at the lighthouse and some have said when visiting him that he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that while Corbin was fulfilling his duty, the official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state caused by years of solitude and thought it would be best that he spent some time away from the island. In 1852, house, he was buried in a small cemetery just south of the lighthouse. The next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends that had visited the new keeper say that he would talk of seeing strange things in the house at night, but he wouldn't elaborate on what he had seen. 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or a family with them at the lighthouse. No strange occurrences were further reported in the lighthouse logbook outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks except on January. The keeper at the time named Betts reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. He wrote a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure, and they never made it to their destination. Over three months later on May 3, 1876, Betts wrote, The two men who were lost last January have been seen several times in Jacksonport. The men were apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account they were still adrift. There is not much hope that they will be found and buried. By 1900 most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas on Lake Michigan. Chester Thorderson purchased all of the island except for the land that the lighthouse occupied in the north. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. Thordarson is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that are still on the island today. On the south end of the island he built a giant st A stone water tower was built on the east side of the island, and an imposing wooden gate was constructed on the west end of the island. The Great Hall was used to store Thordarson's immense book collection. He had over 11,000 books and it's rumored that he possessed some very rare books on the occult in his collection. Thordarson doubly scared him to death. 
I couldn't find any writings from Thordarsson how and him experiencing anything strange on the island. After his death multiple churches and universities were interested in his book collection, but he had willed it to Consum Madison providing that they had to purchase it for $300,000, which they did. Some of this history is hard to find on the internet, but there are a couple binders in the Great Hall that has a lot of this documented. Thordarson's personal papers are housed in the archive section of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. All of this history I gave is just to provide I've had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021 I took my first, and last, trip to Rock Island. After taking two ferry rides I arrived on the island at about 2 p.m. I had booked the remote campsite which is a backpacking site that is a little over a mile from the dock and took a couple breaks just due to how heavy my pack was. I was definitely packed more for camping than hiking. I got to my site, set up my tent, got everything situated, and started gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach so I could start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my site, wrist. it didn't sound close, but it was such an unusual sound that I stopped in my tracks and waited for a good 30 seconds waiting to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued back to my site. When I got back I began working on getting a fire started. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced grouped together, but there's probably 100 yards between each site. There's not a real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between the three sites that there's an obvious path. As I was setting some sticks up in my fire ring, something caught my eye and I looked up. Fairly far or a little further, was a person running in my direction. My first thought was, well that's odd, because like I said it's not even really a trail they were on, then my mind just went to there must be something wrong and this person needs help. They got a little closer and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose grey clothes, maybe in a hoodie, without any details. I quickly stood up from the crouching position I was in and just as I did I heard that high pitched squeal noise again. It was behind me, and it was much closer this time. This startled me quite a bit so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple seconds, but didn't see or hear anything person must be getting close, but now they were gone. Again I stood there and scanned the trees, but did not see them anywhere. I was so confused I was kind of frozen for a few seconds. It was all very strange. But I was able to reason it out in my head that it was just a fellow camper from Site C or D that was maybe running to the pit to forget about it, but it was really just bothering me. I did not like whatever that squeal noise was, and I just felt strange. With some effort I decided to let it go and started my fire. I had a quick meal and a couple adult beverages then decided to take a little walk. I hadn't seen Site C but I did have some neighbors camping nearby. Site D was empty. I did see the path that led from that site to the main trail and pit toilet so that made me feel a little less uneasy about the runner. I figured it was maybe someone from Site C that took a strange way to get to the main trail by going through Site D. It didn't make a ton of sense. I continued on to Site C and saw there was a tent set up. I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I just thought I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as a camping neighbor from Site E and see if anyone looked like they might have been the person running earlier. I came up on the site, and there was a couple sitting like they would have been the person I saw running. I introduced myself, and they introduced themselves. They were probably in their mid-thirties, they were very nice, and both seemed to be pretty drunk, but a quiet drunk. I didn't ask about the runner, or the squealing noises because I thought it might be weird. I wished them a good night back I had a cigar and a few more drinks. It got dark and it started as a perfect night. The sky was clear and I was just staring up and looking at millions of stars. I felt better about everything from earlier and felt stupid about the whole thing and decided to get some sleep. It was a long day so I fell asleep almost immediately up by a huge boom of thunder. It started downpouring. The wind picked up and the temperature dropped. I love camping in the rain, but I do not like camping in a lightning storm. A pretty big storm came through and I was starting to worry. The wind was whipping at my tent and the ground was shaking from the thunder and lightning. I felt very exposed. The storm lasted for a became just a light steady drizzle. 
I was just starting to fall back asleep when I heard the squeal noise again. I opened my eyes up wide in the dark, another louder squeal noise, and it was pretty close. I knew there are no real dangerous animals on Rock Island. There are deer and porcupines, but nothing like bear or wolves. Knowing that still didn't make me feel better though. There was just something about that squeal that I didn't like. I say squeal because that's the best I can describe. I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, but that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured or angry pig squeal. I continued to lay in my tent and started to hear footsteps outside my tent. It was still raining so the sounds were a little buried in the sound of rain, but it definitely sounded like a somewhat large animal. I sat up in my tent and took a knife I had out just to feel better. In my head I just kept saying, you know it's just an animal. It's fine. There's nothing in these woods that can hurt you. I listened as the footsteps started moving away from my tent. I just sat there being still holding my knife for maybe 10 minutes without help. It's fine. It was just an animal. You're being stupid, and you need to get some sleep. I was just about to lay back down when there was a very loud squeal and it was right outside my tent. It felt like my heart just stopped and a shiver went down my spine. My heart was beating so hard my entire It took everything in me but I forced out a Get out of here. Not shouting, but as stern and mean sounding as I could at that moment. I didn't hear any more squeals or footsteps that night, but I also didn't sleep. I just sat there in my tent for maybe an hour before I laid down. Eventually the rain stopped, all that time reassuring myself that I was being stupid. It was just an animal. It was probably 7 a.m. before I decided I had to get out of my tent to relieve myself. As soon as I stepped outside my tent I saw that my picnic table had been turned over and was upside down. When I saw this I surprisingly calmly thought, today. I checked my surroundings and nothing else seemed out of place. I eventually reasoned with myself that the wind had blown the table over during the storm. It still seemed a little strange because the table was pretty heavy and I felt like I would have heard the table flipping over, but that might have made sense. I made some old instant coffee for a hike. I admit, I get easily scared when I'm camping by myself in the woods. Maybe that's natural. After I had some coffee and food, and the sun came out, I realized that nothing I heard or saw was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time. The reason I came to the Orson's Loop Trail that has a lot of interesting things to see, and I was excited to start the hike. I packed a few things in my backpack and started off. Fairly close to my side is the water tower. I have no idea how it originally worked, or why it had to be a tower, but it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked a little further down the trail was a cemetery where two sisters and a few others are buried. It's believed there are still more buried here in unmarked graves. These likely are some of the settlers from the old fishing village. The island has three cemeteries. There is one by the beach and that's where Chester Thordarson is buried, sisters are buried, and there's one on the northern part of the island where the original lighthouse keeper David E. Corbin is buried. There is also at least one Potawatomi burial area on the island, but no one knows exactly where that is. I kept walking on the trail until I came to a nice scenic overlook area with a bench where I sat down and on the trail ahead of me, but I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail and the trees were thick so I sat on the bench waiting for these people to come around the bend. The voices were coming closer and I could tell that they weren't speaking.